My name's Cuid Tokira. I'm a lecturer in forensic psychology uh, in the School of Psychology here at the University of Kent. I don't think I have to work too hard to convince anyone that sexual abuse is a huge problem worthy of, of research and of um, attempts for prevention. Um, what's a little bit tricky is, is to actually get a handle on, on um, the prevalence of, of sexual abuse uh, worldwide. But the best estimates that we have um, suggest that uh, globally about 13% of children will suffer um, sexual abuse during their childhood. As humans, we tend to like um, answers that, are, that for, for problems such as sexual abuse that are simple, that are intuitive, that we can see a causal relationship between one factor and the outcome, in this case, sexual abuse. Unfortunately, the science doesn't lead us in this direction. Basically, the science tells us that, that sexual abuse is a, is a, is a very multifaceted um, problem that, that, and, and, and that the causes are, are, are very varied and vary across individuals. When we think about the sexual abuse of children, um, people often use the, word, the words child molester and paedophile synonymously. However, an individual who has committed sexual offences against children is not necessarily somebody who has paedophilic sexual interest, and neither is somebody who has paedophilic sexual interest uh, necessarily going to commit sexual offences against children or use pornographic material containing children. Sorry, before I continue, it's worth, I suppose, defining paedophilia because, because that uh, might be somewhat strange to people when I say that paedophilia is not, um, is not actually synonymous with, with child abuse. Paedophilia is a sexual preference for, for boys or girls or both who are uh, of early pubertal or pre-pubertal age. So therefore, by definition, it doesn't actually require any kind of offending to have occurred. Um, but as I said, it is extremely important, um, an important factor in, in offending. We know that about 50%, or we believe that about 50% of sexual offenders against children have paedophilic interests. Individuals who have been identified and, and convicted of a sexual offence are at a risk of about 14% for reconviction. So what that means is when individuals when, uh, were, were followed up after about five or six years post-release, um, about 14 out of 100 had actually been reconvicted of a sexual offence. Different factors were important or are important in predicting who's more likely to re-offend. One of those factors is being generally antisocial, but the key factor or the, or the, the most predictive factor is whether somebody has uh, sexual arousal to children. So 50% um, have paedophilic sexual interest and those who do have paedophilic uh, sexual interest are, are more likely to, to, to re-offend. So therefore, it's not all of the puzzle, but it's an important um, piece of the puzzle to, to know and have a grasp on. So therefore, how is um, paedophilic sexual interest typically measured? Well, of course, you could simply ask people. This is, I suppose, sometimes surprising to people, but um, when asked, a lot of individuals identified as sexual offenders, whether they're in treatment or, or, or um, in other areas, um, will openly um, or be honest about their own sexual interests. And that's useful for the, the clinicians working with them. Another way of, of trying to get at um, a sense of whether somebody has paedophilic sexual interest um, is to look at the offences that they've committed. If they've predominantly offended against children, if they've prevent, uh, offended multiple times against multiple children, and if they are, or for example, if they also have um, uh, downloaded um, pornographic material containing children, a clinician can use this information in order to make a kind of judgment call whether somebody is likely to have paedophilic sexual interest. But both of those approaches have, have their drawbacks, and so ideally we'd like to have a reliable and robust and valid measure of sexual interest that's a little bit more objective than those. Um, the main way that people do this currently is through the use of penile pathosmography, or PPG. So what PPG does is it, um, it's a measurement of the degree to which um, the penis uh, changes in volume or in circumference when, it's, um, when, when somebody's present with stimuli. So that stimuli could be um, 
videos or pictures or audio descriptions of consensual sex or rape or of, of sex with a minor or a child um, and by, by examining the degree to which somebody gets an erection um, you, can, you can infer, um, infer their sexual interests. This works well, there's a strong relationship between PPG and, and, and sexual interest or, or self-reported sexual interest and so on. But it's not, a, it's not always the case that there, that there is this relationship. When we look at genital arousal in women, which is measured slightly different to PPG, we find that in straight women in particular, there's, a, um, there's not necessarily a relationship between that genital arousal and their self-reported arousal and also their, their actual uh, sexual behaviour. Also, you can imagine situations that when somebody's being tested using the PPG in a laboratory environment, that their erectile responses might not actually match up with their sexual interest because of the context, because of the unusual context in which they're being tested. There's also cases, of course, where people have erectile dysfunction and therefore the PPG device is not going um, to work very effectively. So there's a lot of reasons why PPG is, is, is currently considered the gold standard but there's also a lot of reasons why it's controversial and that people might be seeking an alternative approach. Um, in my own research, I'm particularly interested in finding these alternative approaches. When an individual is exposed to stimuli that they might find sexually appealing, a whole lot of different processes happen in the brain, even before anything like a, 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 an erectile response happens or a, any kind of gentle arousal. Um, and so it's useful as a psychologist to think about wh at what point can we intercept those processes? Is there ways that we can, we can tap into those processes that happen uh, while somebody's appraising potentially sexually salient stimuli uh, in order to, 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 to find an alternative way of measuring their sexual interests? Um, and so if you kind of reflect on, on, on the, the two images on the screen, you might find one or other of these images um, more or less attractive. You might be able to rate how attractive you find they are. You might be able to, you might find yourself looking at certain parts of the image. Perhaps you find the eyes more attractive or the mouth of, of whatever your preferred image is. So all these, all these processes are pretty available to um, conscious experience. However, there are probably unconscious processes happening as well. You might find yourself, if you were particularly attracted to one of these images, you might find yourself somewhat distracted by that image. Um, and as a result, um, it's slightly harder to, to disengage from that image and to, to return your attention to, to what I'm saying. And so therefore, there are both conscious and unconscious processes going on. And this is what we try and tap into. One way we can try and tap into this is through a technique what, that's known as a viewing time task. The viewing time task is, is quite simple. It's based on quite a simple principle. First of all, there's a self-report element. You're asked on a scale of one to seven how attractive you find this image. But the more interesting thing is not what the answer you give, but actually how long it takes individuals to, to come up with that answer. We find that people tend to spend longer looking and deliberating about images that they prefer. And this has been found time and time again. However, when thinking about how useful this is for actual practice for working out well whether somebody has a sexual interest in child stimuli, um, it becomes a little bit more problematic when you think about this idea of conscious and unconscious. Because whereas somebody might automatically and somewhat unconsciously spend more time looking at their preferred image, as soon as you tell them that we're measuring the time, then immediately then they can actually um, consciously um, alter the amount of time they, they, they spend on each image. And indeed, they, there are commercially available versions of this task that are used for the assessment of, of sexual interest in, in individuals suspected of, of, of sexually offending. And if you do a quick Google search, you'll see very quickly instructions on or detailed outline of, of, of what these tasks measure, which presumably then people can use to actually manipulate their responses. Um, however, viewing time is a useful part of the, the, the um, the kind of battery of tasks that we can use to measure sexual interest, especially in cases where people are not particularly motivated to hide their sexual interests. But drawing on this idea that somebody can, can spend 
uh, so we, people tend to spend longer looking at images that they, they prefer. Um, but, but, but tweaking it a little bit is the idea of a reaction time task. And so instead now of people being asked to write how attractive they find an image, they're just asked to find something on the image, to, so to find the location of the dot on the image in this case. And so this is a much quicker um, task than, than the viewing time. You're asked to do this as quickly as you can. And we're interested in the degree to which you can disengage your attention from the image, so in this case the, the, the woman in the picture, um, and, and find that dot. So again, this is, this is um, based on that kind of uh, idea of spending longer looking at an image, but it's much more um, rapid and, 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 and we're talking about milliseconds rather than, than, than seconds. So again, this is a strong relationship with, with, with people's um, sexual interest. A third, still talking about response time, um, approach that, that, that I use in my research is the idea of an association task. So this is slightly different because we're not now talking about um, how much attention is being captured uh, as such by the stimuli. We're actually looking at the degree to which different concepts are associated. So in this example, um, images are presented and words are presented one by one on the screen and the person taking part simply has to categorize those words and images. Um, and it's not necessarily the answer that they give that's important, but actually how long it takes them to do it. Because in this case, the concepts of male and sexual are paired together. So if something's either male or sexual, you press the same button. And so what this tests is actually how easy it is for you to make decisions when that's the pairing that's, that's, that's associated. And so for somebody who has a strong association um, between the concepts of male and sexual, that should be an easy decision. It might be a harder decision for them in the second half of the task when we flip things and it's now female and sexual that are paired together. So if they don't have as strong an association there, we should see a slowing of reaction time. So again, you can actually chop and change the, the, the words that you use, the concepts that you use, so we could change female and male for adult and child. But overall, these tasks, these association tasks, show again a relationship with uh, people's sexual interests, be that in terms of their, their orientation by, by, by gender or in terms of their interests uh, in different ages. Those three types of tasks put together, they rely on, on the, the participant in the, in, in the study to actually respond using a, a button or some other way of responding. But we were also interested in seeing whether there are ways that where, where we don't even need the person to respond to be able to tell something about their sexual interest. And one really good candidate for this was the idea of pupil dilation. A pupil dilation basically means the pupil dilates to let more or less light into the eye and this happens when, when you go in and out of bright rooms or, or out into sunlight and so on. You'll notice that your, your pupil either contracts or, or dilates to adapt to the, the, um, to the, to the amount of, of sunlight. However, the pupils also dilate to activation of the autonomic nervous system and this was shown a long time ago, 50, 60 years ago, uh, to relate to, to sexual interest. And this kind of fell a little bit out of favour favor because people struggled a little bit to, to replicate the idea that pupils dilate to um, material that, people f that you find sexually appealing. However, with recent advances in eye tracking technology and, and the technology that we can use to look at the pupil dilation, we, we've actually been able to, to show and, and, and other laboratories have been able to show that those initial findings um, uh, are, are, are actually valid in terms of it being a measure of sexual interest. So this is a really promising technique to use, again, that I said that doesn't require any direct input uh, from the participant and um, should be very resilient to any attempts at manipulation by the participant. So what we've done here in, uh, at the University of Kent is we've tried to put all these different types of tasks, along with some other tasks that I haven't had time to talk about, together in one battery of tasks and administer them to the same participant group. So we looked mostly at a student sample um, and we found that each of these tasks were strong predictors of whether somebody uh, had a sexual preference for, for, uh, for males or females. And this, um, these findings were, were, um, were with male participants. Um, these tasks don't work um, as clearly um, with, with female participants. 
the task again for the male participants were correlated with one another. Therefore, if somebody rated, um, if somebody identified themselves as having a sexual preference towards males, um, they also um, would have uh, longer viewing time to males, they would be less able to distract their attention from male stimuli, they'd have stronger associations of the concepts of male and sex, and they would also have greater pupil dilations to male uh, images. So they were all, all of these um, tasks were, were performing in the same way. They also showed what we would expect in terms of um, these, res the, these kind of um, differentiation between males and females in, in line with people's sexual interests was, was apparent for adult stimuli, but not for, for, for child stimuli. Those child stimuli did not produce these effects. And this is exactly what we would expect in a sample of people who are predominantly, who predominantly don't have paedophilic sexual interests. Of course, the next, the next steps of this research are obvious. The first is to, 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 to carry out the, the same types of tasks with samples of individuals who do contain um, individuals who've got um, paedophilic sexual interests. And of course we need to do before we could um, use these tasks as, as, as commercially available tasks for use in, in clinical settings, um, we would need to, to, to show that these are uh, resilient to faking or at least overall when you administer them that we get a really reliable picture of somebody's sexual interests. Ultimately, the goal in this, um, of, of this whole stream of research is to prevent um, future sexual offending. As I hope I've demonstrated, um, paedophilic pedoph sexual interest is not the only cause or the only factor to consider in uh, whether people um, sexually offend. Um, however, it is an important factor and hopefully through understanding these tasks, how they work, it tells us more about sexual interest itself, which allows us to understand how factors related to paedophilia, which might inform primary prevention. But on top of that, having these reliable and robust measures of sexual interest um, will be able to, we'll be able to use them in clinical settings in order to inform how we treat somebody who's come in having committed a sexual offence, and also how we manage risk around that person, uh, because we, we've already seen that people with paedophilic sexual interest do pose the, the, a higher risk of reoffending. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>